let's let's open with a word of prayer and then we will go to our book father god we are indeed grateful for this opportunity you have given us lord thank you for your word thank you for your holy spirit thank you for the gift of teaching in your church father god we pray for your presence to be with us this evening to teach our hearts and to change us lord to help us know christ better the work of christ on the cross better so that we may live the life that is expected from us lord as christians as believers of the cross as believers of the work jesus did on the cross for each and every one of us so we ask your Holy Spirit to be with us, Lord, to give us that enlightenment to open our hearts, to, to see your mystery that is hidden, but also revealed in your word, Father God. Holy Spirit, help me to communicate your message this evening and help my brothers and sisters to receive and give us all an open ear to hear from you, Lord. And through your word, challenge our life and also change us, Lord. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. You know, in our, in our office, we have devotion every morning for 30 minutes. Uh, it's not just a requirement, but everybody's encouraged to attend this devotion. So every time I am really surprised because you now we're there we've been paid for the job we're doing but also we've, we've been given another additional uh, blessing to sit together to pray and to uh, read and study the word of God and so every time I have a chance to just sit like this and study teach or read the word of God I am always grateful more than even the Sunday morning service I'm sorry to say that but <laughs> more than even the Sunday service this really excites me and uh, this is really good so I'm grateful for this the church leadership and for God to prepare this for us so as you all know we have been uh, studying Galatians and my turn today is to talk about Galatians chapter 5 the whole chapter um, before we go directly to the book and start reading, because I gave some uh, uh, responsibility for my friends to help me read, uh, let's just see some important uh, things from this, this book, Mary, just few. Uh, when, when you read the epistles of Paul, it is true not only for Galatians, but other, other epistles is that the first part is mainly theological discussion. Right? It's mainly, I'm not saying it's 100% theological or doctrinal. There are some practical uh, things or issues he mentioned, but the main uh, character of the first few chapters of the books or the epistles is, uh, is you know, talking about theology or maybe doctrine. And the last part, uh, well, like Ephesians, Ephesians is like it, uh, it's a, a middle division, like the first three chapters. It talks, he talks about theology. In the last three chapters, Paul talks about you know, uh, ethics or maybe um, Christian living, what is expected. So, so what? So what? After you know, hearing and studying and learning the theological part, then what? So the life or the practical things will come. This is also true for uh, Galatians, uh, especially from our study from chapter 3 or from our reading from chapter three and chapter four, Paul talks about theology. And then in these chapters, chapter five in the following chapter, chapter six, he uh, talks, he now shifts to ethics or maybe Christian living, uh, some exhortations, some warnings, some practical things are mentioned in this, in this chapter. So basically what I'm talking about today is like practical, practical things uh, in relation to the doctrine we already studied. Uh, so, there are some practical applications to Christian living in these two chapters, or in these two, uh, like chapter 5 and chapter 6. But chapter 5 uh, is somehow, he's talking about balance in the Christian life. 
He's talking about balance in the Christian life. Now, Paul, uh, in, in the previous chapters, he ruled out the Mosaic law. He ruled out the Mosaic law as a reg regulatory standard for Christian behavior. And here now, Paul proceeds to explain how God, how does God lead us? He did this by first discussing two extremes in this chapter. Paul starts by discussing two extremes and then the proper, the proper kind of middle, middle road. The indwelling Holy Spirit now leads us. But we must be careful to follow his leading. So this chapter, chapter 5, can be divided into three. The first part is from chapter 5, verse 1 to 12. The second one is from verse 13 to 15. And then the last part is from uh, verse uh, 16 to 26. Uh, so let's j now go to these chapters and read uh, the, the, the verses uh, first, and then we'll go uh, in detail. So now this is how I'm going to go. Uh, some, I'm, I'm just, I will just go uh, verse by verse. Uh, I'm not, I promise you, I'm not, bo I will not bore you, but I, will, I want to go verse by verse because we have, we have an hour or even more than that. So, uh, If you want to give a title for these parts of the scripture, the first 12 uh, verses of chapter 5, you can, you can say, living without the law. So I give you the, the notes. You can, you can you know, write anything. Uh, from what I'm saying, and also from what the Holy Spirit is teaching you. So living without the law. Uh, Paul, the Apostle Paul, warned his readers not to think that they could satisfy the demands of the Mosaic law by just obeying a few of its commands. Only complete compliance satisfied its demands. So if you want to keep the law, of Moses, you are required to keep every single commandment there. You cannot just pick one that really you know, works or maybe you think that works for you and you know, claim that you are now fulfilling the requirements of the law. You have to keep all the law. This idea is also found in the book of James. James also talks about this. If you want to keep the law, if you are really uh, into that, uh, especially to get uh, salvation, you have to keep the whole law. So that's what Paul is talking about here. In verse 1, Paul's readers were in danger of returning to slavery. Not to the slavery of their um, heathen sins as before, but to the slavery of the Mosaic law. The false teachers were evidently telling them that they needed to submit to circumcision to be truly acceptable to God. Now here, Paul is very much specific when he talks about the law. The law, uh, not, the, not all, all the law, like all the commandments we, we find in the, in the law, but they pick this one thing, circumcision. Uh, we, can, we can take this verse or this verse, the first verse, like verse 1, can be used as a fine conclusion of what Paul was saying previously. He's saying that for freedom, Christ freed us, right? And he also warned them against the yoke of bondage, and which is the law. So because of the nature of the true gospel and the work of Christ on on his behalf, on her behalf, the believer is now to turn away from anything that is, that in, that is related to legalism um, and instead rest in Christ's triumphal work for him and for her and live in the power of the Spirit, or Christ's Spirit. So the appeal here is for the abstin uh, abstinence perseverance in freedom as the only proper response to an attempt to bring Christians once more under legalism. So you might ask, what have we been freed from? Because talk is, the, the Paul here is talking about freedom. For freedom, Christ freed us. So what have we been freed from? Um, we can find four 
uh, four things, still these four things that we are freed from has to do with the law and you can find them in chapter three and chapter four. The first one is we are freed from being subject to the law. We're not anymore subject to the law. You can find this in chapter three and chapter four. And Paul is also talking about that we are freed from the curse of the law. Now, the, the law, was, which was supposed to be a blessing, uh, or maybe to show us the way to get to uh, God, or to be closer to God, is, has become a curse. So Paul is saying that now we are freed from this curse of the law through the work of Jesus Christ. The third one we are freed from is the spiritual powerlessness of the law to redeem us. So the law was not given just to, um, you know, to give, give them some knowledge um, or maybe to claim that they have now something as a nation. It was actually uh, communicated um, the will of God for them as, as a new nation, right? But all its requirements, all its commandments, uh, you know, the, the law told you what you should do or what's expected from you, but there is no power. Now, he, the law will never, ever will give you that power or that grace to live out that commandment. So the spiritual powerlessness of the law to redeem us is also communicated in this in this, uh, in this book. And then the last one is the spiritual business of the law. Um, the law does not have any power to save us or to change us. So this is what Paul is saying. Now Christ has freed us from this. And also he is talking about uh, the yoke of the bondage. In what sense has God liberated Christians from the yoke of slavery? As verse 1 says, that is the Mosaic law. In what sense? Um, different individuals gave various uh, answers to this, to this, to this question. Um, we can mention few. Do not mind uh, the names that I'm, I might be mentioning or maybe the theologians or their theology or their movements, but try to see uh, maybe their ideas, what they are saying to answer this question. Some are saying that uh, we are liberated from the ceremonial laws uh, in the Bible. They are saying that the ceremonial laws are no longer abiding on us because of the days of Christ. Nevertheless, the moral laws, they say, especially the Ten Commandments, are still abiding. Now you see they are separating the law. They are saying the ceremonial law and also the moral law. So they are saying is that God has done away with the moral laws only in a sense that they no longer condemn us. But it's abiding for us to keep these moral laws. Now, you, we can discuss the whole evening about this, these things. It's, um, it's wide. The problem with this explanation is that it makes a distinction between two parts of the law that the text does not make. You cannot find in the book of Galatians, also in other uh, books in the Bible, like the law being differentiated in this way or separated in this way. The text simply says that Christ is the end of the law. That's it. Christ is the end of the law. Both, you, can, you may say, both the ceremonial law and also the moral law. Um, so they, the text does not separate these two. Furthermore, now if they are saying that the, the moral law has to do, basically has to do the Ten Commandments, um, now if the Ten Commandments are abiding, if, if we have to keep the, ten, the ten Commandments, what if, what are they going to say about the Sabbath? Because throughout history, church history, even which is true for us, we are not actually keeping the Sabbath, right? The Sabbath was on, was on Saturday, right? Um, but in the Ten Commandments, we are, uh, or maybe it's, they were required to uh, keep the Sabbath. 
So if the Ten Commandments are still abiding on us, why have Christians throughout history made to worship on Sunday rather than on Sabbath? Um, so we can see some inconsistency here. And the, there are the other groups. The other groups, um, are, they suggest another answer to this question. That means somehow that may be more consistent with what scripture says. They say that God did away with the Mosaic law completely. Both the ceremonial and the moral law, if you will. He terminated it as a code and has replaced it with a new code, which is the law of Christ. In Galatians chapter 6, verse 2, Galatians chapter 6, verse 2, uh, Paul says, carry each other's burden, and in this way you will fulfill the law of Christ. So what they are saying is that God is now done with the Mosaic law, the code, the code of the you know, Mosaic law. But now um, he replaced it with a new code, the law of Christ. So some commandments in the law of Christ are the same as those in the law of Moses. The nine of the Ten Commandments, for example, you know, excluding the Sabbath. Um, we are also commanded not to kill, right? Um, not to worship either other idols. Now, this still works for us. God given codes of law that governs people's behavior existence before God gave the law of Moses. So there are some laws that really governs uh, you know in uh, in uh, our behavior especially in our relationship with god and with other people so in verse one paul is saying that we are actually freed from all all this in verse two paul now began to attack the the judaizers teaching about circumcision he is now very much specific when he talks about the law. We are not abiding to the law now. Insistence on circumcision was a central feature of the false gospel that Judaism were, were promoting. It was the practice around which the whole controversy swirled. So when, when the whole time Paul was talking about the law, the law, the law, the law, actually here he is kind of specific in saying that he's addressing now circumcision. That was the problem. So verse 1 really uh, puts clearly what the problem was, well, what these false teachers were promoting and expecting these, these believers uh, to keep. From verse 3 to 4, Paul is saying that the Galatians or the believers would be obligated themselves to obey the whole Mosaic code if they allowed the false teachers to circumcise them. Uh, now, when these false teachers are requiring them to be circumcised, it was not a suggestion. I don't know, maybe, can you imagine some of them went through, actually, through circumcision? Uh, so Paul is here telling them that uh, if they are going through this practice, actually, they are, you know, now, going to burden themselves to keep all the mosaic law, not only to have circumcision. Their confidence in circumcision would reveal confidence in their own ability to earn salvation. That's Paul's problem. Paul does not really worry about circumcision as such. He's worried that, you know, going through this practice is going to take your confidence from the work of Christ on, on, on your behalf, on our behalf, and um, you know, to put that confidence in our ability to earn salvation by obeying the law. This legal approach, approach to salvation would separate them from Christ since what he did was provide salvation as a gift. So God, salvation without any requirement is given to, to us as a gift. But going through this practice is you know, bringing back again that bondage or that responsibility to earn salvation in our own merits or in our own ability. 
They would fall away from the grace method of salvation if they choose the law method. So these legalists appear to have been claiming that circumcision was a necessary step in the process by which people become acceptable to, to God. So they are setting or giving them some steps they should take to be acceptable by God. Now these uh, steps includes like faith in Christ. Still, it is there. You have to have faith in Christ. But on top of that, they are also saying that you have to be circumcised. So these steps are like faith in Christ, reception of the Spirit, and also uh, in addition all to this circumcision of the flesh. Paul argues that anyone who submits to circumcision to get acceptance with God really believes in salvation by law keeping. So if one believes in law keeping for salvation, he must keep the whole law. Not just, you cannot just pick one law and claim that, or uh, say that it's a requirement that is important for sinners to do. Like, you have to go or you have to embrace all, all the commandments in, in the Bible. So in these two verses, what Paul is saying is that, are you talking about circumcision? Well, here it is. You have to keep all the law to be acceptable by God. Verse 5 and 6, uh, Paul, Paul's approach and the one he tried to persuade the Galatians to adopt was simply to trust God. Just trust God to deliver all that we anticipate in the future because we are now righteous or justified. So here we see Paul talking about the hope. Uh, we see him here, Paul talking about faith, Paul talking about love. This hope includes our ultimate glorification as Romans chapter 8, um, you know, uh, uh, tells us, we do not work for this, but we wait for this. God does not care if a Christian has circumcised body or not. He doesn't care. What does matter is that we trust God because we love him. Note that in, in this verse, Paul united the three basic Christian virtues, faith, hope, and love. In, in these verses, like in verse five to six, Paul mentioned these three words, very important words. Um, and Paul united these three basic Christian virtues like faith, hope, and love. And the Holy Spirit makes all this possible. The Holy Spirit makes all this possible. Um, you can find this, if you pay attention, you can find these three Christian virtues mentioned in different uh, in different books, books in the New Testament, like for example, in First Corinthians chapter thirty, we find these three words mentioned together. Um, in Romans chapter five, uh, in Romans chapter twelve, so whenever to Paul talks about practical life, he actually talks about faith, hope, and love. And here he is not only mentioned these three as what is expected from believers but also he's communicating that the Holy Spirit makes all of this possible in Christian life. So the work of the Holy Spirit is also mentioned here. Verse seven to 10, the false teacher had bampered Paul's readers as they ran the Christian race. God had not let the one who interfered with them to do so. So he mentioned, um, um, like in verse 9, we can find this somehow it's a proverb, and he, he talks about living here. And it could refer to the error in the church, the leading false teachers in their midst. And also the legal requirements of circumcision already mentioned in verse 2 to 3. So here Paul is kind of confident that the Galatians would, would see with him and that they are or God will judge the false teacher or the false teachers. Uh, because somehow it's like he stops all his arguments and now he's saying in verse like seven, um, he said, now you, you were running a good race. Now Christianity and this life sometimes um, is resembled with 
this race. Now, we are, we have all, all, I mean, all of us have our own races, right? So he's, he probably saying that you were running a good race. So who is bumping you? Who's putting you, you know, who's putting in front of you uh, um, uh, something that blocks you from running this, this race. So Paul is trying, or somehow is confident that the Galatians would side with him. Uh, and he says that whoever he is may allude to the high standard of the false teachers. Like whoever he is, when Paul says that maybe this false teachers or false teacher is somehow prominent in this, in this place. So Paul is saying whoever he is, he wants the Galatians uh, to be, you know, to um, forsake whatever that person is teaching them and to side, to side with him. In verse 11, evidently some people are saying Paul advocates circumcision. It's very interesting. Not only they are teaching that, you know, you, you need to be circumcised. They are also saying, it's now this verse somehow communicates that they are somehow, I don't know, advocating that Paul is also teaching circumcision. Well, he may have preached it before the Damascus Road. He actually, he, he preached it. Uh, I, I, I can guess he preached it before his conversion on the Damascus Road. But since then, he had stopped preaching, right? He had stopped preaching. Probably Paul meant that the accusation of his critics that he preached circumcision when it suited him was not true. At one point in, in Acts chapter 16, actually Paul told it that it was wise for some Christians as, such as Timothy to undergo uh, circumcision. Right? Remember, I, I think you, you can remember that in, in Acts chapter 16, Paul circumcised Timothy, right? He, he did that both for the gospel and also for the Jews, right? Uh, but not as a requirement of salvation. It was not a, requ a requirement. But, you know, Paul, Paul said that, now he, that is his philosophy. Now his, uh, Paul's philosophy is that to be everything for everyone, as long as he communicates the, the, the gospel of Christ. Uh, so here, maybe Paul did that but he never advocates circumcision. He never talks about circumcision. But in verse 11, it seems that, like these people were uh, talking about, or you know, maybe somehow advocating that Paul also talks about uh, circumcision. Verse 12, uh, the Judaizers had gone too far with circumcision. Paul wishes that the Judaizers who were so keen on circumcision would mutilate or castrate themselves. It's a very harsh, harsh word. Um, but I somehow felt the hurt of Paul. Like, when it comes to the gospel, he is furious. Here, he, it, it reflects his uh, deeper concern and feelings and how serious this heresy was. It was so serious. Uh, it is, um, you know, ripping out the, the power of the gospel to save one and, you know, adds some other things uh, in addition uh, to, the, to the cross. So Paul was somehow furious. And if God granted Paul's wish, uh, he said, he can castrate himself, right? So if God granted this wish to Paul, they could not produce converts, figurative speaking. And there is also some historical, historical things or customs uh, in relation to these sayings of Paul. If you read some books, you can find there are some people or priests of uh, uh, some, you know, cult practice castration. And uh, so in regards to this legalistic revival there, Paul is now identifying these people with the pagan uh, practice and with the pagan priests. So you can see that Paul was really furious with this. So these 12 verses 
uh, is talking about now we are free from the bondage of the law. Christ freed us. Why do you go back and put yourself under, under um, the, the bondage? So as I said, you can, we, we can uh, title these 12 verses as living without the law. We are free from the law. The law was, was given to them. Like even before the law was given, like God identified Abraham as righteous. He was not uh, given this, uh, this title or this, this uh, like righteousness or the, being called a righteous guy by keeping the law. He was not given that. He was, like, he was commanded to do something and he trusted God and he did and he stepped on. So that is... Uh, so the law, especially according to the New Testament, according to Romans, was given to show the shortcomings of the people. Like, they cannot really fulfill the law and attain what is required, what is commanded uh, from them. So it's like, like a mirror. It's like a measuring stick. And uh, every time you go and face, you know, uh, the law, it shows that you cannot really fulfill. So you need someone, or you need something. Uh, so f if we see this uh, you know, from the New Testament standpoint, we can see that the law was given to show the shortcomings of the people. And um, um, like when we go to the historical setting of these people, the Galatians, of course they were not as such identified as a different sect from uh, Judaism. So there were somehow, when, there were, when Christianity was very young, this Judaism gave them some kind of coverage to, to be strong. And, uh, but this heresy came from within, and they are now demanding them, and also telling them that, actually when they first heard, they accepted only Christ saves. And they started this journey. But in the middle, because they are still with them, they were kind of required to, I mean, they are requiring them to go through all, all, all this. And Paul was totally against it. He said that that was what I preached. And you already received that. You already, uh, you know, took that at heart and trusted and put your trust on Jesus and start that, that journey, that walk. But now here, these people are saying that now you have to add uh, on, on this one, circumcision. And, uh, so circumcision is somehow to be identified with, like to, to have that uh, physical identification with, with the Judaizers.